Hi there, I'm at Bayou Spring in Amsterdam. Uh, I'm here with Alexander, who is the former CEO of Pharmacell, a company that was uh, sold to Lonza last, last year in, in May. Um, and you were chairing um, a panel on advancement in cell and gene therapy just, just a few hours ago. It was really interesting. And you started by introducing that it was a, the best time ever to be in the field right now. Can you expand on why? Well, what you see here now is that in the last 18 to 24 months, this technology, cell and gene therapy, has delivered some very remarkable product and, and therapeutic advances, right? Where in, in uh, beta lymphoma for certain uh, types of patients, really curative therapies have been developed for the very first time. And so there's an enormous excitement in the industry, not only about what this type of technology can bring for those types of cancers, but also when you think about it imaginatively, what the future can bring. And this is where you saw the excitement in the room during the panel discussion. Well, okay, you know, what is next? What, what can we do with the current base and how can we take this further? Yeah. I will go into detail on <laughs> every, every single uh, point you, you just mentioned. You, you introduced by some, some examples of the approved uh, gene and cell therapy of the yes. last past 10 years, which were there? Yeah. Well, uh, the, one of the first ones that were approved, Glybera from Unicure, gene therapy. Made uh, here. Uh, made here in Amsterdam, uh, very, uh, uh, right. And so, uh, uh, subsequently, we have a Strymvelis from uh, uh, GSK for ADA skid, very rare disease, but proving uh, the concept that it could work. And then subsequently, a number of cell-based uh, CAR T uh, therapies have been involved. Uh, 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 Camraya from Novartis and Yescarda from uh, Kite, now uh, Gilead, have been approved. And recently also from Spark, uh, Luxterna for a retinal uh, uh, disease. And so all of those are really breakthrough therapies. And so that's where the excitement is coming from. And let's, so that's, that's great. And but I guess there's still a lot of challenges to be answered and a lot of these challenges were, were mentioned. Um, if we start by the, it's just the, pri the pricing issue. Um, yeah, just the, the, the okay, we are was like over a million or in the million range. As Glybia was, was similar, that was, was raw for the market. The big question on the pricing. Where do you see the, the challenges and, and the outcome to, to fix that? Well, I think the dialogue that needs to take place is really between the reimbursement authorities and the companies, and also the patient play an important role. Because these diseases, or the treatment of these diseases, uh, have a, an enormous value that can be expressed in monetary terms, but also in terms of life gained and quality of life. And it's a societal question on how much that ultimately will be worth. That it's just not only an analytical exercise, not only an exercise on the type of metrics that we have used in the past, but in the coming years, new innovative, uh, risk-based, annuity-based type of, of reimbursement appro approaches may be developed to make this a societally acceptable uh, therapy also from a financial perspective. Yeah. Uh, that's Will, will be solved, I guess. When you when you see that you I can cure so. a cancer, yes, it's, that's it's, a huge benefit. It's a huge benefit. Um, on the on the technology side, uh, the, on the panel, one the senior associate at Forbin was was at Bluebird um, Bluebird Bio previously, and she mentioned the ex vivo versus in vivo. So, what's your view on that? What's like what's the trend in that in that like in that question? Should you do ex vivo in vivo? What, what have you seen really promising stuff like in the recent years? Well, see, on the AAV, which was one of the first platforms for gene therapy, initially there were all kinds of immunological issues. And I think in the recent years, the industry has developed approaches to, to um, uh, control that better. And as the lady from uh, Forbion also was saying, to make it more tissue specific and less immunogenic. Uh, and that has been great, uh, 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 very advantageous for those therapies. So that creates a very easy to apply uh, in vivo uh, uh, therapy. On the other therapies, the uh, ex vivo uh, therapies, there the manufacturing complexity and delivery complexity from a supply chain is more complex because you have to take cells, either allogeneic or autologous cells, manipulate them with viruses and then place them back into the patient which is just more complex. And ultimately, it's the clinical benefit that will drive what is the most attractive, right? But from a supply chain perspective, uh, you know, the, the approaches are different. Yeah. 
talking about the supply chain, one really important point was raised was the manufacturing, and, and you are definitely expert in, 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 that, in that space. And I, I like that comment to say that manufacturing was really part of the, of the product and was one of the key assets of the company. Do you really agree with that, or is it better to outsource the manufacturing right away? Well, I think most companies have a certain, uh, let's say, know-how about the manufacturing from a scientific perspective. I think it's always a trade-off at what point you kind of outsource it uh, and in the way you do it. In the sense that if you outsource it from the, from the perspective that it's now the CMO's problem to figure it out, that probably is a too easy uh, uh, approach. There is a lot of know-how still in, in scaling out these technology, make them more, let's say, uh, uh, streamlined towards the final release in terms of what type of tests, uh, release tests you really need, the way you set them up, how long they take, and what scientific background you need in order to, to achieve that goal. There, that is such a strategically important element yeah. that at least a very close collaboration with the CMO yeah. would be required. It gives you more access to knowledgeable people, yeah. but that also your own folks uh, are uh, very understandable about understanding about how that works in practice. Okay, so we really hybrid model of keeping some yes. manufacturing in house and outsourcing. Because I guess at, at the end, it's, it's also a matter of economy of scale and how you can really make a big like scale your production. Exactly. But at the same time, I, from my understanding, also in manufacturing, it's very customized manufacturing. So, like, do you think in the next like a few years, the CMO will really take over that? The scaling, like the, really manufacturing? The, the, so the unit operations yeah. are very similar between different cell therapy companies, even though the companies themselves may not always recognize that. Because they see one process, yeah. Yeah. the CMO sees many different processes. Yeah. The unit operations are very similar across different projects. So that's not necessarily where uh, the know-how is, but it's within the steps within the unit operations from a scientific perspective where a lot of know-how is developed. And so, really, uh, the, the, the CMO has this type of uh, experience across different processes. You can easily, let's say, play around with different unit operations, has, uh, has access to, to capacity and knowledgeable people, uh, and drive uh, the scale-out. Yeah. And the question for a company is how much capital they want to commit yeah. to those types of activities, scale-out, capacity, and human resource over a longer period of time. Okay. And it makes Total sense, um, and more on the on the with more perspective on the field on self therapy. I, I really like the comment uh, from David from Sim Simpromex on that they were able to develop. I mean, it's really early stage self therapy where the cell react to the glucose level to be like or treat diabetes. I mean, it's possible. Like, what do you think of, of that of that concept, or like, what, what do you think on the possibilities of? Well, I think theoretically that is certainly possible. Yeah. Uh, the, what we're doing now is we're trying to treat uh, diseases which have a very high short-term mortality yeah. or morbidity. Yeah. Diabetes is a very complex uh, disease yeah. uh, where theoretically you can treat that with the types of approaches David mentioned on synthetic yeah. promoters, the d gene therapy driven approach, um, but it will take a long time to get there. Right? I don't yeah. think we should get overexcited to have that in five or ten years. Yeah. We may make short marginal approaches towards that goal, uh, but it will be a long way, specifically for that disease. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so in, the, in talking about oncology, do you see that in, in the next five or ten years, the cost of production, for example, for Novartis, will go down so that CAR-T will be accessible for a bigger patient population and will be like, like a monoclonal antibody today? Do you, do you see that? I don't think we, we can expect that the total uh, unit operation cost will uh, you know, be the same as for antibodies. Yeah. Right? But I do believe that with scale, yeah. we, uh, the total number uh, uh, of, uh, or I should say it differently, the, the, the unit costs should be able to come down still considerably. Yeah. Further automation is still possible. Uh, I guess more intelligent uh, quality control approaches uh, can be achieved, and in this manner, I think that those therapies can be available for a broader set of indications, um, but at a different level fundamentally than, than antibodies. Just the cost is, is, is a different different order of magnitude. Makes sense. And while you mentioned automation, you mentioned it in the panel as well, that at Pharmacel you're investing a lot in automation yes. and trying to remove labor, costly labor from the process. Um, 
Can you expand on that, on, on how do you profit from, let's say, robotics or automation? Um, yeah. Well, I think the, just the organizational uh, challenge of, of uh, 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 manual operations in autologous therapies is, is huge. Yeah. And so taking labor out, it, it allows you to, uh, uh, to have a more uh, uh, and better quality system and more predictable outcomes in, on your manufacturing. Uh, it also lowers the cost and probably the throughput time uh, for getting these therapies uh, uh, finally released. So those are all very important uh, benefits from, from automation and it's again a must in order to make this sustainable uh, for the medium to long term uh, uh, therapy. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, and great to, to go to, to pharma cells. So you, as I, as I mentioned, you, you exited the company to, to Lonza in, in May last year. How was that? Like, how was it to, to, to sell the company? What was your impression? Well, I think for that point in time, Pharmacell had already uh, shown a very nice growth. Yeah. It was really established as one of the leading companies in cell and gene therapy. How big was it? Uh, we had more than 140 people towards the end of the year. And so, um, still, with the growth in the industry and the, the requests we're getting from customers in terms of having uh, uh, access to both uh, sites in the United States, in Asia as well as in Europe, for a small company like us was not achievable. Neither did we have capability to do viral vector manufacturing. And, be try and by becoming part of the Lonza worldwide network, we suddenly could offer customers uh, a transatlantic execution capability, sites in Asia as well as a leading site for viral vector manufacturing in Houston. And so that all combined was a very attractive strategic option for Pharmacell to become part of that group. And that's why we ended up selling and the company. And for autologous, it makes super sense to be, you need to be very close yes. to patients. Yeah. You need to be at least regionally present yeah. for autologous, yes. And I guess my other question on, on, on Lonza, I mean, you mentioned the, the size of the group, but also they have just huge experience in, in manufacturing of biological, and they're one, one of yes. the biggest in the world. So I guess was was really a, a partner of choice or the best partner you could have. Yeah. No? I think Alonza is a leading company in uh, doing this type of contract manufacturing for pharmaceutical companies. This is a new segment in which Alonza in Europe didn't have a presence. Uh, and so they are already more than 100 years in the business. They understand the business about how to build capacities, yeah. how to serve customers for clinical as well as for commercial products. And they have contacts worldwide with, with every company, large and small. Uh, all were great benefits uh, compared to the smaller dimensions that we had uh, with Pharmacy. Yeah, that's great. Um, and I guess that, that contributes also to the to success of the Dutch biotech ecosystem. I mean, you had Crucial was one of the big success stories, some more uh, recent like Unicure or Procure, some other uh, biotech success stories here. Um, can you expand on that? Like, What's, what's your feeling on the the Dutch biotech ecosystem? It's, it's quite a broad question, but what's, what's your feeling? What, what have you seen in recent years? Like in the well, I think that uh, the Unicure and other uh, ventures here in, uh, in the Netherlands have shown that there is a good scientific base yeah. in terms of key universities, Amsterdam, Utrecht, Leiden, uh, that have shown that they can uh, uh, develop some interesting technologies to, to bring the development side uh, forward. I think the entrepreneurial climate in the Netherlands is quite nice because we are in a region in the south where uh, there uh, is the willingness to invest in these types of new yeah. uh, technologies from a manufacturing perspective. I think we, from a pharmacell perspective, have been able to attract a lot of talent from across the globe, in fact, into this region. So for us, it's been a win-win situation. We, I think, made a contribution to the Dutch biotechnology yeah. community, uh, uh, A, by uh, uh, creating jobs for Dutch people, but also by creating a really a mutual beneficial uh, uh, relationship with uh, uh, foreign nationals uh, bringing into the region. So we have a really drawn on international talent pool, yeah. which hopefully for the future can be attractive for the Dutch uh, biotech community as well. And creating value, local value, of I guess, course. as well, with, yes. the, with the exit. Um, that's great, and uh, I had. And what's what's so? My, my last question would be like, what, what's your next steps for you then? For me, uh, I'm looking now at different opportunities in the <laughs> cell and gene therapy. Well, we'll see. It's an exciting field, so I'm sure I'll find something. Enough about. opportunities in the field. Exactly. Yes. Great. Thank okay. you, Alexander, and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank then. you very much. Thank you.